We thank you, Father, that as we sing in that song, we are not alone, that you are with us, that Jesus, you are sitting on a throne, and you're in control of everything, and you see everything, and you see every person, and you hear every cry of our heart, even the ones that we're not willing to admit. We thank you, God, that you are doing a work in our lives. And Lord, we pray that this morning our hearts and minds would be turned toward you. We pray these next few weeks, especially for us as a church family and us as a nation, that our hearts and minds would be turned toward you and we would know that that you have a plan and you have a purpose for everything, God, and your plan and purpose can be trusted. We pray, Lord, that you would align our hearts with yours when our plan's different than yours, that we would trust that you know better than we do. Lord, we love you. We thank you for calling us out of darkness into light. We thank you for calling us in to be a, a part of a church family. And we pray this morning, Lord Jesus, as we, as we engage your word, we pray you would speak to us. And we pray, God, that we would see who you are. Because you're worthy of all worship. We love you. We pray all of this in your good name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome. How are you? Good? Looks a lot like summer out there, doesn't it? Some of us are really looking forward to that. So uh, so thanks for being here today. Um, Lots of cool stuff to talk about and exciting things that have happened. You heard a little bit about the uh, men's breakfast that's next Saturday, right? So Dave Sayers from Real Life Coeur d'Alene is going to come be a part of that. And we just want every, every guy in the church... You're invited. Invite your friends. Um, it'd be cool to kind of hear about what God's going to do through recovery and some of those things coming. Last night, we threw a little shindig here, uh, called it the Harvest Festival, right? Uh, so here's the thing. We've had a few curveballs in 2020, and we got another one this week with uh, the governor moving us to stage three, and then Shoshone County going to code red, which... I don't know what all of that means to be, I don't know that the CDC knows what all of that means sometimes, to be honest with you. But as a church, we want to be good neighbors, and we also know that God's put us here for a purpose, to love and serve this community, right? So we got together, how are we going to do that? Because we normally do a harvest festival, we've done it for 13 years at Pinehurst Elementary, and I'll just give you, uh, I'll just be honest, we were pretty excited to be able to do that in our own building. Uh, this year. Well, we weren't able to do that, but what I love about you is you put your heads together and you said, how can we love and serve this community and and just do it differently with all of the different curveballs? It's like standing at the plate, you know, the World Series just got over, right? Standing at the plate, here comes the curveball, sinker, screwball, fastball, all in one, and you're like, we're going to take a swing anyway. And last night, you hit it out of the park. You did an amazing job, church. So in all of my paperwork here, I have, so people have been asking me how many people we served, and they tell me that the number was at least 750. Um, Someone told me that's a low count because we literally had cars lined up on both sides of the street, excuse me. We became like a huge traffic jam. Google, I think, changed their traffic patterns because of what went on here last night. Um, But more importantly than numbers, and numbers matter because each person, right, people matter. I want to read to you one of the feedback comments we got on our Facebook page last night. I just wanted to say thank you for such a wonderful event that you put on tonight. It was incredible seeing all of the willing and cheerful volunteers And my kids said it was the best Halloween they've had. Thank you so much for serving our community in such a big way. The love and light of Christ was shining bright from your church tonight. Isn't that cool? That's why we want to do what we do. Thank you. So my voice is a little chowder today because when it comes to things like that, I... I can't help myself. I'm like a little kid that yells at people having fun, and so I'm paying for it today. So 
Something else I want to bring your attention, the lower right-hand corner of the announcements. So we've got a, a voter information guide I'd like to bring your attention to. There's a group out there called Intercessors for America, and they've got a really uh, good website. And what they've done on the website is they've listed all of the candidates and the platform uh the platforms of the Democratic and Republican Party. And they list all of that. They list what all of the, uh, the, the, the candidates have voted for in the past. Now, I believe as disciples of Jesus, we need to be disciples of Jesus in our work, in our, in our homes, right, as we recreate, but also as we vote. So one of my encouragements to you, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I'm going to encourage you to go check this information out before you vote, pray before you vote, and vote for the candidate that most lines up for your values. Um, we know that no candidate or no personality is perfect, right? Hang out with me for five minutes and you're going to find that out, okay? But, but we have to, voting is one of the ways that our voice is heard. And the, and the nation needs to hear our voices. So you need to vote. If you don't vote, you don't get to complain. Okay? Um, but let's, let's vote in accordance with what we believe about Jesus. So I just want to encourage you in that. That's, that's on there. You can even, they've got a voter guide where you can put your zip code in, and it will tell you all of the candidates that are on your ballot and, uh, and just kind of give you a little information about who to vote for. You guys ready to get in the Word of God? going to be in Acts 18 today. By the way, didn't the, uh, let's see, Jeff and Brian and John Cook, who all preached these last couple weeks, didn't they do an excellent job? Yeah. Um, I love that I get to be a part of a church that we care about living out um, what Jesus has called us to. I love that we've got these young men and young women in uh, the various ministries in the church who are being discipled and raised up to be who God has called them to be and is calling them to be. Uh, one of the things that happens after I have someone preach is people come up, does this mean you're leaving? Um, well, hopefully, hopefully not yet. I mean, God's got a plan that he's going to take me to be with him one day. Um, I just hope it's not tomorrow. But uh, for us, we practice raising and discipling people at every level of our church. So we've got these, these men and women, you know, some of the guys that you've watched preach these next these past few weeks, and a younger generation that will be coming up soon that we're going to be investing in. Those are some of our future pastors, elders. Um, you're seeing uh, here on our, our worship team, we've got some of the younger folks that are serving in worship team. We've got a whole generation coming up. And, and, and what we're trying to do here is they're going to take the gospel to places that we won't, right? They're standing on our shoulders to take the gospel forward. So I love that I get to be a part of a church that has a ton of grace for those people, but also that just wants them to succeed. So, and God's just brought some amazing people, um, men and women, to our church as they're raised, uh, being raised up. Um, so we're going to be in Acts chapter 18 this morning. And I want to kind of help set the foundation for the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, 8, we get kind of the key verse of the book. And this is Jesus. He's talking to his disciples. He, this is just before he ascends to heaven. And he's talking about the fact that they're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he says, when you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you're going to receive power. And he says, this power has a purpose. It says, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so we saw, as we've been going through the book of Acts, we saw that pattern um, expressed. We saw the, the gospel come to Jerusalem and people come to know Christ. We saw that happen at, the, at Pentecost when 3,000 people became Jesus followers in one day. We saw it start to spread. We saw it go into Samaria we saw um, um, people who were far from God, an Ethiopian eunuch. We saw Gentiles start coming to become followers of Jesus. We, we, we watched it start spreading. We've been looking at, at Paul's missionary journeys here recently, 
where we've watched it go to Thessalonica, Thessalonica and some of those other towns, and the gospel continues to spread. And today we're going to watch the gospel come into Corinth. But before we get there, there's another. Let me just ask you a question. When you read the Bible, do you ever look at the Bible characters and think, man, I wish I was like those guys. They're really something. And you look at yourself and you're like, there's no way God could use me like some of these people. Because I know what the things I've done. Anyone ever feel that way? You look at Paul and you're like, that, I mean, Paul must have been like seven foot tall and looked like Thor and had a full head of hair. And he was amazing, right? One of the things that I love about the Bible and there's a lot to love about the Bible. But one of the things I love about the Bible is they, they, they leave all the, all the goofy stuff in. They leave all the quirks in, right? And what you start discovering is, as you read the Bible and really start pouring into it, you understand that the people God uses are just ordinary people with insecurities, regrets, um, awkwardness. Just like we have, right? And in fact, we get uh, in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, there's a a little passage where Peter and John had gone into the temple to pray. And when they were walking into the temple, there was a lame man standing there. And and, and this lame man uh, was, was begging for money. And Peter and John look at him and they're like, we don't have any money. But what we do have, we're going to give to you. And he tells them to stand in the name of Jesus. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. Stand up and walk. And this man stood up, and he's so excited, right? In fact, what happens is he starts, I think, hanging on Peter and John because they healed him. I I don't want to let go of these guys because walking was way better than what I was doing before. And so Peter and John are like, do you think we healed this guy? And they start preaching the good news about Jesus in the temple. Well, a bunch of people got mad. And they're like, we don't want you to preach about Jesus here. In fact, we've warned you not to preach about Jesus. And the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, ended up arresting Peter and John. And they start, basically, here's the, the, that chunk of scripture boiled down in North Idaho terms. If you keep preaching about Jesus, we're going to beat the crud out of you. And Peter and John are like, man, do you want us to, should we obey you or should we obey God? Right? There's this whole thing going on. Well, there's, this, there's people watching all of this go on. And w- one of the things we learn from that that you need to understand that I need to be reminded of is that nothing you do occurs in a vacuum. People are watching you, which can be a little freaky when you think about that, right? But here's the cool thing is you follow Jesus People are watching you to learn what it looks like to follow Jesus. And here's a passage in Acts 4.13. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. Unschooled, what that means in that time is they were not brought up in the typical rabbinical teaching, uh, uh, teaching system. There are some in here in this room this morning that have probably been to Bible college and you've got a degree in um, teaching people about Jesus or you've, you've got a, a God degree, for, for lack of a, a better term. But there's many of us in this room that don't. And so one of the things we see here, we, when, we, when we enter the Bible and when we, when we, enter, when we uh, uh, become followers of Christ, there's almost this this idea that we can get that we don't know enough to tell people about Jesus yet. We, we're unqualified. But the thing that I'm so encouraged is it says these guys were unschooled, ordinary men. They hadn't, they hadn't been through the typical religious education system, but they'd been with Jesus. So what Jesus did is while he was with them, he discipled them and revealed who he is to them. Right? And, and he revealed who God is, and he revealed what the purpose, he was preparing them to plant churches. When I first read that passage, I was like, oh, this is good. I'm an unschooled, ordinary guy, and I'm pretty comfortable being unschooled and ordinary. So what happens sometimes is we read that passage, and we're like, I know just enough Jesus to be right here. I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I'm good. 
But one of the things that, that I want to talk about here today, real quick, the sermon before the sermon, is one of the one of the the one of our, our core values here is that we're going to make disciples of Jesus who can make disciples of Jesus. So one of the things we encourage you in is that Jesus meets us wherever we are, right? But we're going to encourage you to get into a, an environment where you can be discipled, where you can learn who Jesus is, where you can not only learn who he is, but you can learn uh, how to start sharing Christ with others. And that's why we do men's groups and we do women's groups and we've got home groups here. So we're going to encourage it. And some of you have been around the church a long time. And it's time for you to start encouraging others and discipling other people. Get in a small group and learn how to make disciples. That's, that's God's plan A. Sound good? Okay. Let's jump into Acts chapter 18. If you remember right, as, as we've been going through the, uh, the missionary journeys these last couple weeks, we've been in these, uh, I think Athens is where we were last week. And it says in Acts 18.1 here, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. So I'm going to have them put a map up here so you can get a little bit of an idea of where we're, we're at. So um, Athens is right here. That's where Paul was. And he goes just this little distance over to Corinth. Now, interesting thing about Corinth, it's only 50 miles away. But these two towns couldn't be more different. Athens was known for its culture. Athens was known for its knowledge. We, we saw last week when John Cook talked about the... Uh, uh, the Aragapos, I think it's called, where they would gather and talk about all the newest things in society. They had all these temples to these different gods, and there was one called an unknown god, and Paul went there to talk about this unknown god and talk about the fact that his name is Jesus, and he's, he's God and Lord of everything. So we saw that last week. This 50-mile distance, Corinth, uh, Corinth was a, a, a bit of a different town, it was known for commerce. You see, there's two seas on each side, the Aegean Sea and the Adriatic Sea on the other side, I think, right? And it's interesting, there's a little isthmus in Corinth, and in those days, they would actually take boats from one of the seas to the, uh, over here to the other, they would drag it across this isthmus so they would avoid all of the storms by going south. And there's, a, there's actually a canal built there now where they can cut through that, uh, that piece of land. Um, the city was known, it was the, uh, where the temple of Aphrodite um, uh, existed, who was the goddess of fertility. And the, uh, one of the ways the goddess of fertility was worshipped was through, um, through sex. And so they had a thousand female prostitutes that would ply their trade in the city at night in the name of worshiping uh, this, this goddess. They also had male prostitutes there. Uh, to be known as a girl of Corinth, or a, a Corinthian girl, is what the nickname that would be given to prostitutes in towns all over the region. To Corinth, Corinthianize uh, was a term they would use to be immoral. It was just a, a word that they used. Okay? Kind of a rough town. So in that town, Paul's in Corinth, and there he meets a, a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently com come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. So the way I understand it is in Rome, the, uh, when, when, the, when the gospel was being preached, there would be riots, there would be uprisings, as we've seen these last few weeks. And so uh, Claudius is like, um, all of you Jews, I'm kicking you out. So I want you to see Priscilla and Aquila. And oftentimes you'll see Priscilla's name mentioned first. And the reason is, is they believe that her name was connected to some kind of royalty. So they would mention her name first. But I want you to think about them. Okay, they've been kicked out of their hometown for following Jesus, basically. We, I, I suspect that's why. Okay, so they're kind of refugees. Okay, but one of the things I want you to see about them is just because they get kicked out of a place, it doesn't mean their walk with Jesus stops. It's kind of important to us because it's very possible that some things may be coming in our country that we don't line up with, that we don't agree with, that we don't like. 
It doesn't mean our walks with Jesus stop. It goes on here. Paul went to see them because he was a tent maker as they were, and they stayed and worked together. So Paul's planting a church in Corinth, but he's also got to um, uh, support himself. So he supports himself by making tents. And the way I understand it, they worked together during the day, and he probably spent time uh, discipling Priscilla and Aquila in the evening. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So as has been his custom, he would go to the synagogues where there's God-fearing people, right, Jews that are, that are uh, open to what God is doing in their lives, and he would go there to preach the good news about Jesus. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, <clears throat> Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So Paul and Silas come from Macedonia, it appears, bearing a gift. And now he's got this financial ability where he's not going to tent make anymore, but he's going to just devote himself to preaching the gospel. Now those words, devoted exclusively, it's interesting. It means constrained. Constrained. And I want you to think about this for just a moment. Paul could have said, oh, I don't have to work now. That's awesome. Now I can preach the gospel, I can get a four-wheeler, and I've been wanting to learn to play the cello. I can do that. But he didn't. What it says there is maybe those temptations he had to live a life like all of his friends, he had to say no to those things so he could focus on the thing that God has called him to. Now, it's interesting. I'll have conversations with people. Hey, tell me about, you know, what small group are you in? Or, or tell me about what God's doing in your life, where you're serving. And people are like, oh, I can't. <laughs> I can't. Well, why not? I am too busy. I mean, my, my schedule? Huh! I'm like, oh, man, did you get ripped off? Did you somehow get like 20 hours in your day? Did God only give you five days a week? I mean, come on now. See, we, we've got this, this thing that we do. We can be honest in church, can't we? we got this thing that we do. Uh, and we do it in the church. That we say we want to be Jesus followers. But that's really not accurate. We want Jesus to follow us. We just, we just want enough Jesus to get us into heaven, if we're, you know, especially those of us that are older, okay, because I'm thinking about those days now you know, as I get closer. I want to get to heaven, but I also want to feel a little less guilty. And if he could fix my wife, that'd be great. Right? She's at the back of the room. I can say those things. I'm, I'm, I'm praying some of you are going to stop her on the way. <laughs> I've heard people say that. I mean, I haven't said that. <laughs> I, are you with me? But here's the way God wants it to be, you guys. Is when he sent Jesus, he sent him to be our Savior and our Lord. Which means he becomes the focus of everything. And so we actually reschedule our lives, reprioritize our lives around him, him being number one priority. It means there's some things that I have to say no to. It means there's some things that I would maybe rather not say yes to that I have to say yes to. And so my question for you today is what do you have to say no to? Some of you know there's some things that God wants to pull out of your life that you've been maybe fighting and kicking and screaming against. But also maybe there's something that God's asking you to step into and you're like, no way. No way would God ask. God would never ask me to plant a church in the Silver Valley. Never. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's roll. Verse 6. But when they opposed, God, opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest to them. So he's preaching the gospel. They, they start opposing him, as has been the rhythm that we've seen as we've gone through the uh, book of Acts. They become abusive to him. He shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Okay, so we, we got to talk about it. This goes back to Exodus 33, that statement. And the idea of the statement is, in Exodus 33, 
it says that if you're manning a gate and there's a, a trouble coming and you don't call out the trouble and the people in the gate get killed because you didn't, do, you didn't war, uh, sound the warning, their blood is on your head. But what he is saying right here, remember as we've talked, if we've watched in the book of Acts, if you've, if you've been with us, and you can go to rlmsv.com and get caught up with our, our website, our, our, uh, our past sermons, is Paul is sounding the alarm. There's a day that Jesus is going to judge the living and the dead. And we don't know if it's today. We don't know if it's tomorrow. One day he's, he's saying every person is going to go and stand in front of God and be judged for everything that they've done in the body, right? Everything they've said and everything they've done. And, and he's telling them, and you don't get to control when that day is. It could be tomorrow, and, and so there, there, there's a way right now, without Jesus, you're separated from God in your sin, he's telling them, right? But Jesus came, and he, he was a sacrifice for sin on the cross, and he invites you to receive him as Savior and Lord. He invites you into a relationship with him. And now's the day. Press in. Say yes to Jesus. So he's, he's preaching these things to them, and they're abusing him. I don't want to hear it. We heard last week there were three responses. Some said yes. Some said I need to hear more. And some just, I mean, they're abusive, so I'm guessing this is part of the group that says, I don't want to hear it, right? And he says, okay, your blood's on your hands. It's, this is, I can't do your, I can't say yes for you. I, I need a volunteer just to stand up here. You don't have to do anything. Okay. I got Ashley, who's moving back to the valley to be a part of this church. Yeah. Okay. Stand right there. Would you put the, the slide up there? Okay, so one of the things we talk about here all the time in our conversations, when we have spiritual conversations, there's three parts to every conversation. There is God doing his part. And here's what we believe. Jesus said that I'm always at work because my Father is always at work. So do you believe that God's at work right now? When you talk to your neighbor about the, the gospel, do you believe God's at work? Yes. Now, in this conversation, I have my part to play. So if I'm preaching the gospel with Ashley, I, have, I, I, I'm, I can only do my part, but I'm wildly responsible for my part, right? Ashley has her part to play. I can't do her part. And not only is this important for us as we're sharing the gospel with people, but I think this is pretty important for us in our kitchens. Like, so I'm going to give you a little quick marriage coaching piece, okay? Oftentimes, if we're having what we call intense fellowship, okay, in our kitchens with our spouses, one of the reasons that it's so difficult is we're hyper-focused on what our spouses are doing or not doing. Can I get an amen? Okay. It doesn't just happen at my house then. Thank you. Now, the thing that I have to know is I can't be responsible for my spouse's part, but I am incredibly responsible for mine. And I think where we miss the boat sometimes is we won't do our part in these conversations. I won't share the gospel with someone um, because they're not going to accept it anyway, right? Or I, I'm awkward or uh, whatever. But I'm absolutely keeping this part out of the conversation <laughs> because I don't know that we actually believe that God is at work in our, in our world. We don't, I don't know that we believe that God is at work in our relationships, and so one of the things that we know, because if we do, what we'll do is before we have those conversations, we're going to pray our guts out for that person, right? We're going to pray for our spouses. We're going to pray for those people, our neighbors. You know, I'm going to go take some brownies to my neighbor, and I'm going to pray before I take those, those brownies to the neighbor. Hey, Lord, would you use these brownies to show the love of Christ to that person? Before we did our harvest thing last night, we, we prayed, Lord, would you somehow through candy and Elevated sugar levels for kids. Would you show people that, that you love them? And God did. Because God shows up. Because he's always at work in people's lives. Does this make sense to you? Thank you so much. I love Jacob and Ashley. Okay, let's, let's get after this. Um, where are we? 
Okay, he says, from now on I will go to the Gentiles. Uh, end of verse 6. Then Paul leaves the synagogue, and here's what's hilarious. He goes, right next door. I mean, it looks like the, the synagogue and the place that he goes to actually share a wall. And he starts preaching the gospel there. And it, it's, it's the house of Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. Now, Crispus, the synagogue leader, the one that was leading the synagogue next door, well, he becomes a, a, a Jesus follower, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. Isn't that cool? In the midst of all of the abuse. And then I want you to see what happens in verse 9. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I'm with you and no one is going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. Why do you think God told Paul to not be afraid? This isn't a trick question. Come on, let's work. We're Sunday morning. He was afraid, right? See, here's those little nuggets that God leaves in the Scripture for us to find out that, that, that God didn't raise up a, a breed of superhumans to preach the gospel, but he used normal, ordinary people just like you and me because Paul is absolutely afraid. He's like, I don't want to go to Corinth. Lord, send me to, I don't know, Wyoming instead of Corinth. The people in Corinth aren't nice. The people in Corinth, um, they're, they're, they're immoral, God, right? We don't know. Maybe there was temptations for Paul there. He, and Lord, I'm tired of getting beat up. I mean, can we just be honest? I'm tired of getting smacked around for you. And here's what he says. Don't be afraid. And, and look at in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. You can turn there if, if, if you want, but I, I'm going to have the scripture on the screen. This is what Paul writes about when he went to Corinth. He says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. When you read the writings of Paul, you actually get a sense that he wasn't all that great a speaker. You get a sense that he's not this tall, good-looking guy. He's probably like a middle-aged, balding, dumpy guy. He probably wasn't super eloquent in his speech. He was a good writer, but it appears face-to-face -face he was a little bit awkward. He says, I didn't come with all of this eloquence. He says, as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. But he came with a real clear message. Let me tell you about what God has done in my life. He goes, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because here's what we believe. We believe the power of, the power of God is that he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The power of God is, is that he so loved the world that he sent his son to save, uh, to save his enemies. And he, he was crucified on that cross. He rose from the dead, and he invites us into relationship with him. See, there's the powers. The power is not in, in the words that you and I use. The power is in God who sent his son. He goes, I came to you with weakness and great fear and trembling. My message and preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom. I don't want your faith to rest on how good I speak, but on God's power. Do you see that? And so this is for you and I. Is we're, 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 we, we know that God has sent us we know that we have a message. It's amazing. I don't know what the numbers are specifically, but most Christians will never share the gospel with someone else. They'll never lead anyone to the Lord. It's not because God's not at work. It's because they choose their fear. They choose their their uh, they they choose they choose themselves over God. Is I love what. Uh, let me find this here. I love what Spurgeon says. He says, the fear of God 
kills other fears in our hearts. I want to say that again. The fear of God kills other fear in our hearts. Paul's trembling. He knows, as has been his, the rhythm of his life, that when I preach the gospel here, it's probably going to be hard for me. I'm, I may get stoned to death again. I may, get, I may get beaten. I may get jailed. But man, I know what God's called me to do. And I fear letting God down way more than I fear you guys smacking me. And so here's what happens. Uh, there's also three promises in this passage that I just want to give to you. God told him, um, he said, I'm with you. And so I, I just want to, you know that song we just sang, I am not alone, right? When, when God, when we become followers of Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit within us. Has anyone ever felt lonely? Right? It's one of the, the number one things that plagues uh, Americans right now, especially during this pandemic, is not only did we already feel alone because most people don't have close friends, but also then we say um, the close friends you have you can't hang out with. Right? And you were created for 3D, real um, fellowship and, and relationship with other people. You were, God created you to know other people and to be known. Right, so many guys uh, my age, right, are checking out of life early because um, th they run into the challenges that everyone runs into, but they have no one to confess their sins to. They have no one praying for them to encourage them. No one knows their struggles. And so one of the things that we can know is that God is with us, right? Two greatest commandments, love God, love people. The second one that we know is he says, no one's going to attack or harm you. Now, we got we to gotta break this one down a little bit because something can happen to me physically. But, but the, the thing that I can count on in that town, God's like, yeah, nothing's going to happen to you. I'm going to protect you. But being in the middle of God's will is like the safest place in the world you can be, wherever that place is, Nairobi, Nigeria, Venezuela, Venezuela. South America, some words I just can't say. Silver Valley, Seattle, being in God's will. So the worst thing that could happen to you is not that your body dies. The worst thing that could happen to you is that your body dies while you're separated from Jesus Christ. And then your soul perishes. And here's the deal, if you're doing God's will, you're right with him, aren't you? This is what we want. He goes on here. Look at this. He goes, um, I, I have many people in this city, right? I am with you. No one's going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. And here's what he's talking about. He's talking about this group of people that, that God either um, depends on what side of the, whether you believe in election or you believe in God knowing how people will respond. It doesn't matter. Here's what God is saying. There are many people in this community that are going to become followers of me. They just haven't heard the gospel yet, Paul. And that's why I'm sending you there. And this is a promise for us, is I believe there are people in the Silver Valley, there are people in Coeur d'Alene, there are people in Montana that God is calling. And God knows they're going to become followers of Jesus. And they just haven't heard the gospel yet. And he says, church, I've called you. This is, this, this is, that's, that's your mission field. When you go to work, there are people you work with that have not heard the gospel yet. There are people you recreate with. There are people that you go to school with. They have not heard the gospel yet. There are people in your neighborhoods that haven't heard the gospel yet. And he says, church, my plan A is that my church is going to be mobilized and on the move to take the gospel to all of these different places. There's no plan B. You're it. Does it make sense? Okay, let's, uh, so, so uh, Acts 8, 12 through 23, I'm not going to put this on the screen. Oh, I, well, here's what I am going to say. Paul stays in Corinth for a year and a half discipling those people. It's interesting, he's in Athens probably two weeks. He's in Corinth a year and a half. Why the difference? <laughs> they needed it. <laughs> and that's part of it. I think the other thing is Corinth is such, a, such an important town being a trade center. That he knows, man, God's super strategic, 
right? I love, like, like in our church right now, I love what God's doing in preparing us for that next wave of people that will move to the valley that we're all very happy about, by the way. If you're not, mm, you and me. <clears throat> but here's the other part. As the world gets darker, the light of Christ needs to be brighter. Because there are the, the days are coming. It's coming, folks. We, we, God's like raising us up and prepping us right now, I believe. Okay? So, so here's what happens in these, these next few verses that I'm, I'm just going to give you the 38,000 uh, foot view. Is there's a proconsul in Achaia named uh, Gal G Galileo. So Judaism was a legal religion in Rome. They weren't adding any religions. So they bring charges against Paul to basically say he's preaching another religion, outlaw this religion. Gallio, as he looks at the religion, as he looks at Christianity, he's basically saying, you Jews don't agree, that's not my problem. And so what he basically does is he says that Christianity is just another sect of, of Judaism. Now, here's what that did for Paul. It gave him permission to preach the gospel all over Rome. It gave him a green light. He had, didn't have to worry about the Roman authorities now. Okay? Now, here's what's funny. They get so mad that it didn't turn out the way they did that the, the new synagogue leader, they grab him and start beating on him. It's like, hey, you're new in office. Awesome. We're mad at you. Okay? It's pretty funny. And then what happens is we see that Paul's going to leave. Um, in fact, let's go ahead and put that, that map up there again. So th this becomes kind of the end of the second missionary journey and the beginning of the third missionary journey. So he leaves um, Corinth here. He goes to Ephesus, which is over here. Then we're going to see he's going to go to Caesarea, Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem, then he's going to go to kind of work his way up, and he's going to end up in Fer Fergia and Galatia. So these are kind of parts of the next missionary journey we'll talk about in these next couple weeks. I just want you to get a little picture of where things are going. Now, in Acts 18.24, I want to introduce you another ordinary guy named Apollos. Now, this guy has been educated but he understood the scriptures to a point. He understood about the baptism of John, but he didn't understand about the baptism of Jesus Christ. He didn't understand the coming of the Holy Spirit yet. So he's a pretty gifted guy. So he's up preaching. And you remember, Anna, or remember uh, um, oh my good, uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, thank you. You remember them? The refugees? that had every reason to give up, they hear this gifted guy, Apollos, Apollos, preach. And they're like, wow, God's going to use this guy. But he doesn't understand everything yet. So they, instead of jumping up in the middle of a sanctuary and having a public debate or, or trashing him on Facebook, they said, hey, let, let's have dinner. Let's hang out together. And they disciple him so he can understand um, the, the completeness of the gospel. He was an unschooled, ordinary man, but they helped him be with Jesus. They discipled him. Do you see that happening? Okay. And I, and I love that. So there's a couple things that we see there. First of all, we see the willingness of Priscilla and Aquila to stay committed to the, 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 the mission that God called them to, to make disciples. We also see a... Humility in Apollos. Young men aren't known for their humility. It's not a hallmark. It's we see this humility of this guy, that he was willing to be taught. And then as it finishes up here in verse 28, it says, well, let me go back to verse 27. When Apollos went to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. Verse 28, 
for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was Messiah. And that's the work, not only of his gifting, but that's the work of Priscilla and Aquila in his life. Does this make sense? Okay. So I got a little bonus scripture for you. And then we'll be done, I promise. I haven't preached in two weeks, so he knew there was something coming, right? I was thinking about this. Paul spends a year and a half pouring into Corinth. And then within three years, he writes another letter to this church called 1 Corinthians. And if you've ever read 1 Corinthians, it's a tough letter. Like half a dozen times, he calls them out on their sexual immorality. He calls them out on the fact that you guys can't get along. You're like having lawsuits against each other. He says there's prostitutes in the church that are like advertising their wares. He's like, and you guys are just like allowing all of this stuff to happen. You're not, you're not, you're, you're walking in sin. You're not, you're not dealing with sin in the church. It's okay. He says, uh, <clears throat> just all of the, you're not, your worship of God, you get, when you take communion, some of you are getting, you know, you're taking the wine and getting loaded. There's people in your in your in your in your mix in your in your fellowship that are that, that have nothing and are starving to death and and, and the and the people that are just getting fatter aren't taking care of the people that don't have anything. If you read that, Paul's like, oh, oh, what do you think of that? Oh, how do you like me now? I mean, he it's tough, right? And so when you read that, you're like, what in the world happened? And I think this is such an important idea, concept for us. Because as a pastor, one of the things that I'm, I'm just consumed with nowadays is helping people to finish well. None of us start out well. We all have this sin nature that we've received from Adam and Eve, right? And then we meet Jesus, and he gives us new hearts, and he gives us new minds, and, 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 he, and, he, and we become followers of Christ. But then I'm watching pastors I'm watching people. I just ran into a friend here recently who w was a small group leader that I was, I, was, I was with, and he was making disciples of Jesus, and I talked to him the other day, and he hasn't been to church in like five years, and his life's a train wreck. I'm like, what, what happened? There's a passage that we use in our 101 class every month. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I just want to share this with you this morning. And I can't think of the church in Corinth without thinking of this passage. Paul says, I'm not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you. That letter is the letter of 1 Corinthians. Though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Now I'm glad I sent it. Not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow that God wants his people to have. So you were not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow that God wants us to experience. Can you see that? The kind of sorrow that God wants us to experience. Leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Just see what this godly sorrow produced in you. Such earnestness, such concern to clear yourself, such indignation, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal and such a readiness to push, punish wrong. So there's this idea of repentance. See, here's what I think happened to Corinth. Here's what I think could happen to us. Is that you take your eyes off of Jesus. And you put your eyes on all of the other things that are clamoring for your attention. And there are many. There are many different voices clamoring for you to pay attention to. And even it can be as easy as is what you feel about masks and no masks or elections or, you know, people from other places, 
Um, uh, Maybe it's the economy. Maybe it's health. But what happens is if we're not careful, we take our eyes off Jesus and we forget that Jesus is Lord of all. We forget that Jesus has a plan and purpose for each one of us. We forget that Jesus' plan and purpose may not look like our plan and purpose. We forget when we read the scriptures that Jesus tells us things like, actually love your enemy. He tells us about praying for our enemies. And it's not just praying, Lord, could you like drop something on their heads? But it's praying for them, Lord, would you open their eyes to your grace? Lord, would you open my eyes to my grace? It's forgetting that Jesus' primary role in our life isn't to make us happy, it's to make us holy. And what happens is, is we take our eyes off of Jesus and we take our eyes off of the work he wants to do in our lives and those sins come in, don't they? Some of them are sins that we've struggled with in the past. I deserve a little break. Or maybe they're a whole new batch of sins that we didn't, we didn't see coming. But what happens is, is, we, is we read the word or, or maybe we quit reading the word. Or, but when we read it, we'll read something that's kind of hard and we'll say, but I'm doing okay. And so instead of repenting, which means looking at my sin the same way God does, and turning away from that sin and turning towards his righteousness, instead of doing that, we allow that sin to percolate because it's not going to hurt anybody and no one else knows. But I will tell you that sin will take you farther than you want to go. And I've heard it said, and I think this is a good analogy, when, when you walk willingly into sin, it's like giving the, the devil a gun that he puts to your head and he gets to decide when the trigger's pulled. You don't get to control that. You don't get to control the consequences of your sin. And so what happens is, is they forget that. And and what happens then is the the culture of the church changes. The culture of the community changes because we all, I I can't talk to you about your sin because then maybe you'll talk to me about mine. And, And so here's the thing. As I've talked to people where they're like, man, why do I, I'm tired of repenting of sin. Every time, I don't even want to open the Bible because God shows me something else I'm doing wrong. That's God's great love for you. That's how he changes you. That's that's the sanctification process is he's trying to make you look more like Jesus. So I I, I took a selfie this week to to show you a little bit about how this stuff works. I've been working out. Can you tell? So we, 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 we talk, I, I just, I, this is like a little coaching piece. Is I, I want you to understand how we believe this stuff works, okay? So uh, head, heart, and hands, okay? Remember last week, I think it was, John Cook taught about knowledge. Remember that? Or, uh, he talked about the difference between knowledge and wisdom, okay? Here's, here's the knowledge or facts, things that you get in. So I have knowledge about Scripture, Okay, wisdom is when that knowledge becomes part of what you do, when you start applying that stuff to your life. Okay, it's, 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 it's this 18 inches between the head and the heart, and I will challenge you that this 18 inches is the longest 18 inches in all of the world. Because I know a lot of people that know things about God, but the group of people that take the things about God that they know and actually put those into practice in their life where they become wisdom is a much smaller group of people. And then what happens is that knowledge, what's in your heart, plays out through your hands, through your actions. It also plays out through your mouth. The Bible says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's interesting. You'll say something, right? And you'll be like, someone will call you on it if you're, if you're fortunate. And you have someone that's willing to call you on that stuff. You're like, oh, I was just kidding. Well, no, you weren't. That's actually an overflow of what's cooking inside your heart. And God loves you enough to show you. And sometimes it goes the other way, I think. Sometimes uh, God asks us to put things into action, right? Let's say it's lying, and you're like, man, white lies aren't that big a deal. And God's like, thou shall not lie. And you're like, okay, I'm going to put that into action, right? I'm not going to lie. And what you find out is you, not, is you don't lie. You find out that God's word is actually accurate, and it becomes wisdom. So sometimes I think it goes two directions, but it's an ongoing process, church, and there's no other way. we got to do our reps. Repentance is welcome to the life of repentance. 
is what we do. Does it make sense? All right, I got a couple things to finish up with real quick. Number one, uh, implications down below. God uses ordinary people like us to do extraordinary things for his kingdom. It's all he's got. People like you and me. With our insecurities, our lumps, our bumps, our regrets, all of those things. Jesus says, come follow me and I want to use you. Come follow me and I want to do a work in your life. And not only do I want to do a work in your life, I want to do a work through your life. The things God does in your life aren't just for you. They're for other people. Second one here, if you're a new or a young believer, our invitation in to you is to join a small group where you can be discipled and, uh, and you can mature in your walk with Jesus. Where you can learn to invest in other people spiritually. Had a dad come to me a couple weeks ago whose kid, he's just, he's just struggling. He's like, man, I, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to raise him. And it, the, the cool thing was, instead of just getting frustrated and doing what some dads do, I'll just yell louder. He got in our small group, and now he's learning how to disciple his kid, and he's learning how to, how to have grace for his son, and he's learning to have grace for himself. And I love that, because that's God's way. If you're a mature or a maturing believer, join a small group or a service team where you can learn to disciple others, where you can learn to help them grow in their relationship with Jesus. If you're already in a group and you've just been kind of hanging out every week, go to your leader this week and ask them, hey, how can I... How can I help? Put me in, coach. And this last one, how can you or you and your family or your small group start ministering to your neighbors? Because we say that, I believe that everyone's been called to be a minister. And when you read it here on our board, it says that we want to minister in the church but we also want to minister in the world. And there's some things that you can do individually that only you can do individually. Maybe some relationships that you have outside of the church. But then there's some other things that God will call you to do that it's way better if you bring friends. Amen? I, I do way better with friends than I do by myself. And so grab your small group. Grab your kids. One of the best ways... To raise kids well, I believe, is to show your kids that the world's not all about them. And we're going to provide some opportunities for you to bring your kids to so they can learn to minister to other people. But also, I think one of the best ways is for you to provide opportunities for your kids. Let's go to the neighbor and, and rake their leaves today. It's a beautiful day out there. Let's go take care of leaves. Let's take a meal to somebody. Snow's coming. Let's... Uh, which is a blessing. Let's go shovel some snow together. Let's go cut some firewood or stack firewood for someone. That's one of those practical ways we can show the love of Christ. So I'm going to pray for you guys. I'm going to pray for me, us, and then I'm going to ask Jeff to come up and lead us through communion. Father God, thank you for being so good to us. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your Holy Spirit who gives us new hearts. Thank you for your word that reminds us of who you are and reveals your heart to us, God. Thank you for this church that loves you, Lord. Just watch people's lives changed every week here. I'm watching uh, people stepping into ministry um, and serving other people. I'm watching marriages be restored. I'm watching kids raised to know the Lord. I'm watching grace extended. I'm watching people um, who realize their need for others pouring into their lives and praying for them. And I just believe all of these things bring glory to you, God. All of these things become a witness of who you are in this community. And I pray, God, by, by the power of your spirit, you would empower us to continue to say yes to you, Jesus. To continue to be humble, to continue to encourage one another, to continue to pray for one another 
to continue to say no to those things in our lives that get in the way of you and to say yes to those things that you ask us to step into. And Lord, I, I, I'm just mindful of that next generation who's coming after us, that you're asking us and um, calling us to be an example to them of how to finish well with you, Jesus. We give you all praise this morning and pray this in your good name. Amen. Thank you. So uh, Gene challenged us to, one of the things he challenged us with was, was to kind of look past the things in our lives that clutter our lives, whether it's sin or just stuff, the election just things that consume us and, and, and really focus on Christ and what he is in our lives. And we don't always think about that. And this is a perfect time to do that as we, as we take communion here. So I just challenge you guys just to focus on Christ and who he is in your life and realize how much bigger he is than all that stuff. Uh, but communion is a time for Christians, those who call themselves Christians, to remember what Christ has done in our lives. Uh, if you're not a Christian, I just ask you just to allow it to pass by and You'll have an opportunity tonight to change that. Uh, it's also a memorial for what Christ has done in us and Christ has done in our world and he's done in our lives. Uh, it's a picture of the new covenant of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's also a public proclamation for Christians uh, just to let people know as we take it that we are Christians and that we do, we do know Christ as our Lord and Savior. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 it, t it tells us to, to take communion in a worthy manner. So as the servers start passing it out, if you could hold it to the end and we'll take it together. Uh, but 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us to take it in a worthy manner. So we're going to go through a time of directed prayer and prepare our hearts to be able to take it in a worthy manner. Uh, the first thing and most importantly is do we have any sin in our lives to confess? Um, anything that we've struggled with or failed at this week? Uh, God forgives. First John 1 and 9 tells us that. So if we have any any uh, unconfessed sin in our life, this is the time to, to just to bring that up to God. Uh, next, pray for friends and family that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And also pray for those who are hurting, uh, whether it's ourselves, a family member, physically, mentally, anything that anybody is struggling with, prayer is a powerful thing. And then finally, pray for the church's in the Silver Valley and, and around the world. We're just one small part of the body of Christ here, uh, but we want to serve our community. So if you guys could lift those four things up in prayer uh, for a couple minutes, and then we'll take communion together. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink the cup together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word tonight or today, and we pray that uh, it takes a hold of us, Lord, and, and we act, we go out into our community and we actually um, heed that word, God, and not just make this a, hey, I went to church on Sunday, I'm good for the week, uh, but be a living participant in the body of Christ this week, Lord. We thank you for this time of communion, for this service, this opportunity to worship together. And we pray that you'll just bless the rest of the service. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. If I get some small group leaders and our elders to come up, we're going to have one more worship song. And then uh, if you need prayer for anything, there'll be some folks up front.
uh, to pray with you. Go ahead and stand as we close the service. There's a grace when the heart is on to
As we leave, one thing I want to let you know about is Tuesday, we're going to have our sanctuary open, have some music playing, we'll have coffee on. So if you, uh, before you vote or after you vote, if we, we just want it open so you can come here and pray for our nation. So some of us will be around, and I just think there's, when, when we come together in one voice unified, there's power in that as God works through his people. So I want to encourage you in that. Uh, continue to be praying right, is whoever gets elected does not determine the mission of the church. Jesus Christ has already set that mission for us. So Lord, help us to love and serve the community we live in, regardless of who is elected into office. So let's pray this morning. Father God, we love you. Lord, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit who empowers us to be who you say we are. Lord, help us to be reminded of who you say we are and, and to walk that out. We are a loved people. We are a people who have a perfect God who wants to show off literally to the, the generations through the work you're doing in, in this place and in these people. Lord, uh, help us to, to walk in freedom and in courage. Uh, we love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your good name. Amen. Amen. Say hey to someone on your way out, church. I love you. God bless you.